Hello and welcome to Giving Ventures, a podcast to help you grow your giving and change the world for the better. Each episode, we share innovative charitable efforts leveraging private philanthropy to solve public problems. I'm your host, Peter Lipset, Vice President at Donors Trust. This show is a product of Donors Trust, the oldest and largest donor advised fund focused on helping conservative and libertarian donors of all capacities simplify, protect, and grow their giving. My colleagues and I talk with a lot of groups doing great work. This show lets us share a bit of what we learn with you so you can discover new projects for your own philanthropy. How do you make change? How do you convince lawmakers, local leaders, or just your neighbors to back free market ideas and be supporters of liberty? Universities and think tanks are important for developing and translating ideas into policy prescriptions, but who can mobilize people to action? This is where the grassroots organizations come in, and we have three great ones with us today. FreedomWorks Foundation, Americans for Prosperity Foundation, and Moms for Liberty Foundation. First, an important caveat. Throughout the episode, you may hear me and the other guests casually throw around phrases like C3 and C4. Many of you listening may be well-versed in the nuances of the nonprofit tax code, but for the uninitiated, a quick primer before we get started, because grassroots activity can and often is split in between the two different parts. A 501c3 nonprofit is probably what you're more familiar with. It's a tax-deductible public charity that can, among other things, educate people on issues and policies. It is the 501c4 organizations that can do issue advocacy and lobbying. Because these groups are directly advocating for laws and policy change, gifts to C4 groups are not tax deductible, though they are still nonprofit organizations. All three of the groups we're going to talk to today have both C3 and C4 arms, and the C3 has the word foundation at the end. There are times when I may get a little fast and loose with dropping the foundation as shorthand uh, in reference to the full constellation of sister organizations these groups have, but hopefully that education versus advocacy distinction will become more clear as we go along. For what it's worth, if you're giving from a donor-advised fund, then gifts can only go to support the 501c3 educational operations. Okay, enough with the clarification and the tax diatribe. Let's get into the action. FreedomWorks is one of the oldest and largest grassroots organizations advancing liberty, emerging way back in 1984 out of the free market bastion at George Mason University. It has evolved and grown over the years with efforts in education and regulation and so much more, and serves as an influential voice among some of the most ardent free market elected officials. Adam Brandon has led FreedomWorks for eight years and been there for 18 and has a much greater track record of success than his beloved Cleveland sports teams. Uh, so, Adam, let's let's I want to start with a macro question for you, because you're a smart guy. You, you think about this stuff a lot. Why do you think the left is generally regarded as being so much better at grassroots than the right? Or, or is that premise even correct? Am I just buying into that common attack that, oh, if it's a conservative grassroots group, it's clearly just AstroTurf? I think it actually, there is a lot of truth to it. And I believe the truth comes from, I hate to say it, funding. The left for a long time, like a hundred years has gone back. You go back to the early union movements and things of that nature. They've always invested in grassroots and shaping public opinion. And to me, politics is downstream of public opinion. So the, the, you, if you're a young person on the left and you want to get involved in politics, you can get involved in unionizing Walmart. Then you get involved in a city council race. They've developed an ecosystem about winning elections and winning hearts and minds of voters. And our side on the center right just has not made that type of investment. And I think it's just a different cultural thing. Our folks, they go to college, they graduate, and they get involved in the private sector, where the other side is perfectly comfortable moving in between nonprofits and government and back to nonprofits and back to government. And so it's a different mindset, but that doesn't mean it's not important. I still believe the reason you do grassroots is to shape public opinion. And that's why I've always been attracted to grassroots advocacy. Well, let's talk about the grassroots advocacy that y'all do and the the ecosystem. Uh, So where does FreedomWorks fit in? What makes FreedomWorks FreedomWorks? And maybe distinguish also between FreedomWorks and FreedomWorks Foundation. I know you have a lot of different, different things. Well, when I explain it just in general, you have think tanks that play an absolutely essential role in producing ideas. You've got people who work on movies. You've got people who work on a variety of different things. 
but we want to make sure that we are talking to that average person back in America who's watching TV and wants to get involved, and we want to give them an opportunity to show them that you can get involved. And, and I think about in my own family, my mother-in-law is famous for saying things around Thanksgiving table like, hey, these politicians in Washington never listen to us. Well, that's not true. In fact, politicians over listen. Uh, the problem is, is that the constituents they listen to tend to be, uh, the, the, again, going back to your first question, the better organized people on the left. When you walk through halls of Congress, you see well-organized groups. So our job is to go out, talk to people, and show them it's pretty easy to actually make your voice heard. And we'll show you shortcuts. We'll teach you how to call your congressman. We'll teach you how to visit your senator's office. And increasingly, uh, it's, let's get involved in local issues like school boards. Uh, that is an incredible place for activism. Even if you feel Washington is broken and beyond repair, you have a school board and you are incredibly influential at that local school board. All right, we're going to come back to the school board thing in a minute, but help us understand that difference a bit because you talk about educating them on how to reach out, but then there's the actual reaching out. That's a distinction between kind of a FreedomWorks foundation, like an education thing and a FreedomWorks activism side. Is that fair? Correct. Yes, because the foundation can't say vote for this bill or vote against this bill. The Freedom Works found or Freedom Works just just Freedom Works Inc. can say that stuff. So you first Freedom Works C three can train the activists because uh, it is confusing. How do who do you call? Who do you visit? What do you say when you call? We can help you break down those barriers. And then the next step is we'll educate you on some issues like, look, there's a really good bill that's moving. Call your congressman and tell them support this bill that's going to check uh, future growth of government spending or call your congressman and tell them this bill that's going to massively expand regulations. Tell them you're against it. And so that's how we kind of use our C3 and our C4, one to educate and the other to train. But we find once you train an activist, someone on how they participate, it becomes addicting. They realize how easy it is, and then they get their friends and their neighbors. And I think you're going through a shift in public policy today where, and I think a lot of this is due to social media, uh, politics used to be, be on the back of television ads, and now the most powerful thing is connecting with the individual members via social media. So we help train people to understand how you use social media to make your voice heard in these various offices and debates. That's great. All right, so we, you alluded to it in terms of school boards, et cetera. One of the projects that's really taken off for you all since COVID is your BEST project, B-E-S-T, yeah. which is an acronym. You can spell that out. But talk to us about that. Well, what BEST does is the, the focus is we got to get people like, yeah, you have a Senate office, you're going to get 100 or 1,000 calls. But a school board meeting, five people, two people show up, they're going to have a significant influence on that direction of that school board. So we, we like to organize under BEST even more than under FreedomWorks. It's the same organization, obviously. But we have found that the people coming into BEST, this education side, which is like, hey, let's let's take a look and see what you're teaching the kids. Let's make sure we want to make sure that all facets of American history are taught. But let's make sure it's balanced people. But that those types of emotions, that's not just a right wing thing. That's also people across the political spectrum. So a lot of the people who participate in our school board programs, they're not traditional conservatives or libertarians. They're they're just middle of the road people who want to get more involved. And they want to learn, how do I get involved? And what's really great is we've actually had dozens of people um, who've ended up getting elected to local school boards after just being a concerned parent or grandparent. And we're trying to, again, break down those barriers to get involved in the process. When our government was laid down by our founding fathers, it was designed to be a, a government that the citizen was actively involved in. When, when, when Benjamin Franklin was said, it's a republic if you can keep it, the keep it portion is your average citizen was involved. And if, if the citizens don't get involved and we devolve into just we're a vote and nothing else, the system is going to collapse. The system is designed that you're a voter, yes, but you're an active participant in all levels of government and far beyond voting. And that's what I look at as the resurgence of the American Republic that we're starting to live through right now. And BEST is an acronym. What does it stand for? 
Oh, uh, it's it's better education uh, for students tomorrow. I believe it's uh, it's an acronym we came up with just because we like the term best and we like using it. But I always just refer to it, the program as best. But it's get. I mean, the, the whole goal of the program again is to get you to start to teach you how to get involved in school boards, and then we've just seen remarkable. Uh, People have, some people just like working more on school board issues than they like on federal issues. They feel they're having more impact, and that's inspiring, and that's why we do these programs. Now, if education is the big, hot, sexy issue, the complete opposite of that would be federal regulations. And yet, somehow, your team is fantastic yep. at engaging activists to get them to call uh, during comment periods and all of these kind of mundane things on this boring but important issue. How do you do that? Well, the first thing is the realization is that um, uh, the process of a regulation, you do have a public comment period. And the mistake that is often made on the right is that there's a form letter and everyone signs a form letter and sends it in. That counts as one comment. So you have to have different comments, but these comments, as we discover in the process, become very important. So when we, 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 so it's not just a form letter, it's you have to train people on what the issue is and to have really valid opinions, and then they have to go write the letter themselves and write the comment themselves. But if you take 100 activists and they each have a different version of the same comment, those count as 100 comments. And so we train people on why this issue matters. Then we show them how you actually get involved in the comment period because no one knows how to do that. No one, they hear a reg coming through and it's like, well, how am I supposed to comment? Where do I put the comment? So we help, again, take that barrier down for the activists. And a lot of times we'll look at it. We'll log in three, four, five thousand comments and we'll be half the docket. And, and then you'll see that they have to react to these comments. And the regulators, they do. They, they have to. And then also it gives you in, in further down the road. It all these comments can actually get into the legal realm where it gives standing for potential challenges. And you can identify people who are going to be negatively um, affected by these different regs. And I mean, the whole idea here that eventually we're trying to train people to do is that when you have this imperial presidency, you have this imperial regulatory state. And the idea is that going back to our founding principles, Congress and the Senate push off difficult votes onto the regulators so they don't have to be held accountable. So part of this long-term vision on, on explaining this to Americans is part of the reasons we have this distant and sometimes unaccountable government is that you've got to steal it back from the regulatory state. And so that's both pressure on the regulatory state, but also pressure on congressmen showing that we are demanding that you, yes, you, congressman, elected official, you need to start pulling this power back as well. It is a very fraught political time right now. What do you think the biggest upcoming challenges are going to be where free market grassroots, where freedom works, can really have a voice? Well, I think the biggest challenge you're looking at right now is that we're going through a demographic change in America that we've never really seen before. First of all, we're getting older as a country, and we've always been a very young country. And so problems that we've had on, say, our entitlements and spending... This is mostly driven by the, the changing age demographic. Like I, I'm a, I came to the city to fight spending. And in 10 years, we're going to go from right now 31 trillion in debt to 50 trillion in debt. And 75% of that growth is driven by Medicare alone. Mm. One program. And so the challenge we have is that there, there's also a shift. Not only are we an aging population, but the demographic mix this is the first election that the plurality of the voter is going to be Generation X, which is my generation, I'm 45, and then below the millennials. And in a couple election cycles, millennials will be the plurality, not the baby boomers. But it's an incredible opportunity for us because our research shows when you talk to that 35-year-old housewife with kids, um, well, she's not a housewife, she's working as well, but that woman She's concerned about the future of these entitlement programs, and it's an incredible opportunity for us to broaden the base. So the biggest challenge we have right now is our base is shrinking, but the greatest opportunity is there's this huge opportunity with younger voters, not necessarily college voters, but after college. And it's the opportunity for us if we can expand our base is there's a whole new generation that believes in economic freedom, that believes in, in some of these core tenants. We just haven't started talking to them yet. Well, we are glad that FreedomWorks is out there trying to engage them, trying to talk to them and, uh, and get them involved on sexy issues and non-sexy issues, but the important work of keeping the Republic alive. Adam Brandon, thanks for joining us today. 
thanks so much for having me. And uh, you guys do great work. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't do our jobs without you. So appreciate all the work you guys do. Our next group, Americans for Prosperity Foundation, started in 2003 with a state-centric model, beginning in just three states, Wisconsin, Kansas, and North Carolina, with both C3 and C4 activist arms. It now has chapters in 38 states and is active in all 50 and has candidate support vehicles with 527s and PACs, and it's just really, really expanded over the years. So today I am very happy to talk with Akash Chogali, Vice President of Americans for Prosperity, and someone who has come up through the ranks there, having served as policy director before, and then went off to the Hill and elsewhere, and now is back and uh, has, has grown just as the organization has. So Americans for Prosperity Foundation has, from the beginning, been built around this state model. Uh, as I mentioned, do you, would you say that's the big differentiator for AFP uh, amongst the other grassroots groups, or, or how would you describe that? Yeah, I think it's twofold. So it, it is the state-based model, absolutely, and, and our folks that have been around a very long time like to tell the story of the very first state chapter. It was just a collection that met on a January day on the shores of a, of a lake in Wisconsin, uh, and one of the people, I believe there were like 10 people that showed up. One of the people that showed up that day was a young man by the name of Scott Walker, who at the time was, I think, just a county executive um, and obviously got involved with our organization early and it became a vehicle uh, for him to be more involved. And obviously he went on to, to some great things as to the state with the help of the AFP state chapter. Uh, and I think that kind of embodies both of the things that make AFP and AFP Foundation unique. One is the state-based model, right? That we think the greatest opportunity to make the greatest impact is at the state level, right? Our ability to make policy change at the state level is, is obviously greater than it is at the federal level, though we're active there now as well. The second is that grassroots activism piece. And, you know, as you mentioned, there are other organizations that do that. But I think, one, the size and the scale at which we're able to operate, the number of field offices and uh, just the, the quantity of people that we're able to talk to, uh, as well as the sustained model, right? That we don't pack up shop. Our offices never close, you know, when it's not election season or legislative season or whatever. They're open, you know, 365 days a year, educating, you know, activists, educating lawmakers, talking to legislative staff. So I think those are the two things that have really made us unique and helped us grow over the years. And how do you decide what issues to focus on? I mean, the there are seven issues listed on the website, and you know economic freedom has long been a part of it. Uh, and, but you also have immigration and healthcare, criminal justice, foreign policy. Some of these seem a little bit outside the typical "quote unquote" conservative grassroots policy areas. It kind of depends what you mean or how you describe yourself as what it means to be a conservative, right? I mean, I, I would consider those to be conservative causes for for what it means to me uh, to be a conservative. But as you mentioned, we started out just focusing on economic opportunity issues. Um, and those kind of remain the bread and butter for our organization. It's the largest portfolio, we think, and I think it makes the largest impact on the well-being of the American people. The reason we started adding on some of those other issues is because we very quickly realized um, that there are a lot of barriers in our society for people to thrive and create that broad-based prosperity, right? Healthcare is a really, I think, an obvious one, right? That Healthcare costs are always something people are super concerned about. Their access to care, or the quality of care, I mean, that obviously very directly gets to your, your personal well-being, right? Then you talk about education and people's ability to make sure that their children are receiving the education that they deserve and that's right for them, uh, especially if that's not being provided through public schooling. Um, you know, the criminal justice system, the immigration system, all these various things can impact somebody's ability to achieve the American dream. Uh, and that's why our portfolio has expanded. But, you know, within a set of issues, all which tear up to the ability of every American to build their American dream. And that really is the the centerpiece of it all and kind of the, the through line for it all that makes that makes sense. So what do you do for the grassroots? I mean, how much of AFP's work is is activating the grassroots, which I guess would be more of a 501c4 activity in many cases, but not necessarily all cases, versus educating the 501c3 at AFP Foundation type side? I would kind of put it into three buckets. Um, the first is, and we do this with a number of organizations that we partner with, many of whom don't even necessarily work on the same issues as us, but we do actual training of how to be an activist, right? So if you're going to write a letter to your lawmaker or create a social media account or organize a rally, organize an event, like really sort of brass tacks, how to be an effective activist, um, those trainings, uh, are sort of one piece of what we do. 
The second piece is issue education, right? The sort of bare bones basics of, you know, the basics of tax policy principles. What does good tax policy look like? Good labor policy, good energy policy. Very, again, high level, what good looks like, what bad looks like kind of thing. And then there's a third piece, which is probably what AFP on the C4 side is best known for, uh, which is that actual activism, right? Holding lawmakers accountable, contacting lawmakers for and against different pieces of legislation after they take a vote, telling them that, hey, we support you or, or you know, we disagree with this vote, that actual kind of hands-on activism. So those are the three buckets. I think um, that last piece probably gets the greatest resources, maybe the most attention from the media and things like that, because um, it's kind of, again, what has made AFP a, a household name in political circles, at least. But um, that third piece of activism does not work without the other two pieces, which is one, the information, and two, the how-to of how to be an effective activist. Yeah, that makes sense. And one of the important areas where AFP has been involved is in Hispanic outreach, and you've done a lot with this, uh, reaching out on with a fro, pro-free market message. Uh, and you do this under the Libre Institute, which at one point was its own standalone organization, now part of the constellation of brands that is that is AFP. So what have you learned from this outreach? How does how does Libre operate? Yeah, they're they're fantastic. And it's it's a joy to work with them. And that team has grown enormously. Their impact obviously has grown enormously across the country. They focus particularly in a handful of states with large Hispanic populations, Arizona, Texas, Florida, places like that. Um, I I think what we've seen is two things. And what I've seen is two things that I've really enjoyed watching. Um, one is the hunger for these ideas in the Hispanic community. The the president of the Libre uh, Institute and Libre Initiative, Daniel Garza, likes to tell a story that, um, you know, the first time he went out and did one of these events, it was a crowd of people, you know, frankly, just like him, many of them immigrants. They've worked, you know, challenging physical, you know, physically demanding jobs and, and are just trying to make the ends meet for their family. But, you know, geared towards progressive politics for a long time. And he got a question, you know, that, that a man had tears in his eyes and was asking Daniel, like, why has no one ever told us this before, right? When he brought this message of economic freedom, economic opportunity, and how it can improve their lives. And so there's a hunger for these ideas. And I think you're seeing that play out, you know, in election cycles and in the news every day. The other is what it takes to actually reach people and connect with them. Um, and I think Libre does a fantastic job of this, where it's not always about policy and politics. Sometimes it's just lending a helping hand, or it's even just building community. Like, hey, we're going to bring people together, hold an event, you know, do some kind of back to school thing if it's this time of year. Um, so there's other ways to kind of bring people into your fold, build trust, build community. Um, I think particularly in the Hispanic community is very valuable. And, and they've been able to do both of those things, which is build community uh, and, again, bring the ideas to a, to a population that's hungry for them. I remember in the early days of Libre, again, when it was still kind of an independent, but it sounds like it's carrying on, they were going into communities and not just pounding this message, but they were doing tax prep stuff, uh, yeah. you know, tax prep days and things, frankly, stuff that grassroots groups on the left are actually pretty good at. And they were employing some of the same tactics, but bringing this pro market message. So I'm glad to hear it sounds like they're still doing some of that yeah. kind of work. Ab absolutely. And I think the other thing that makes, you know, not only Libre uh, grassroots staff and even AFP grassroots staff unique is they're not people that live in the D.C. area and then fly out and do this stuff. Right. They are from there. They grew up there. You know, for example, we have a state director who's a who's a sixth generation person in the state that he that he's a state director. In, right? And, you know, in, in the Libre community, it's the same situation where people have been there for years. People know their faces, things like that. So I think there's an inherent trust in our grassroots model because of the people who, who embody it in those communities. So we talked about Libre. You mentioned the education, I think it's the grassroots education initiatives, kind of the mm -hmm. program for that. We have the C3, the C4. We haven't gone deep into the PAC and the 527 that are working in, or in elections, but obviously those are important too. It's this whole constellation, as I kind of alluded to. How do they all work together? And kind of make, how do you make sure they're all going in the same direction? Yeah, absolutely. The, the common thread is all of them have the goal of getting policy right, right? We want good public policy that can empower every American to achieve the American dream, right? And, we, and largely, we do that by breaking down government imposed barriers. So, you know, while they serve sort of different missions, as far as, you know, so the C3 does issue education or investigative work, the C4 does legislative work, uh, legislative advocacy, things like that. And then the PAC obviously is doing election activity for and against various candidates. 
um, all of it is geared towards changing policy, right? So for example, our, on the, the 527, the PAC side, we're not engaging for any one particular political party and we don't engage in a race just because somebody has a particular letter next to their name or identifies with a particular party. We are engaging for policy champions, right? Or, or candidates that we believe will become policy champions in the legislature that the C4 then can work with to advance good policy, stop bad policy, and we can work with their staffs and educate them. So all kind of driving towards the same North Star is the common thread. In the last couple seconds, what do you think the big item is for AFP, AFPF over the course of the next six to 12 months? It'll, it'll be the, the economy by far. I think this is one of the great disconnects between what you hear in the press and what we've seen at the doors. Our organization has knocked between phone calls and door knocks, talked to nearly 3 million people. We're here at the end of August, which is by far the most of any organization. The economy is by far the most important issue to them. And so that's the issue we're going to be talking about them too, and that we're encouraging people on the campaign trail to do the same. Well, I hope that message gets through and it's an important one and glad that AFP is out there helping people understand how to engage in their community around these important issues. Thanks so much, Akash. You got it. Thank you, Peter. There were a number of new groups that formed or grew rapidly in response to the government overreach we saw during the COVID pandemic. And one of the fastest growing among these grassroots groups is Moms for Liberty. I've had several Donors Trust clients ask me just in the past couple weeks about Moms for Liberty and what are they doing and what do you know about them as its star just continues to rise. So I am happy to have Tina Deskovich, one of the co-founders of Moms for Liberty, with me today to help us unpack it and help me better answer this question when our clients call and, and ask me about it. So Tina, how do you describe Moms for Liberty? And we are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization, a national grassroots organization of moms and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles and cousins that are concerned about what's happening in education across America. Uh, but our mission statement is very focused on uh, saving America by making sure parental rights are protected. We unify, educate, and empower parents. Uh, to defend their parental rights. We understand and we know that parental rights are under attack in America through government entities and their overreach. And so we are working to defend that. And how did it get started? I, I couldn't help notice in looking at your bio and the bio of your co-founder, Tiffany Justice, you were both on school board. And if I'm reading it right, uh, if I got the timeline right, you were on school board when COVID hit, which I'm sure was very interesting. Uh, so how did that experience factor into the founding of the organization? It's everything of why this organization has been founded. Tiffany and I, like you said, are former school board members. We did not know each other uh, when we served. She served in a different county from me in Florida. We served from 2016 to 2020, and we experienced uh, huge issues while we were on the school board. The Marjorie Stoneman Douglas uh, massacre happened while we were serving just two counties below us. Uh, and that changed education in the state of Florida forever. Uh, we had to implement a lot of security measures, mental health measures, things in schools, um, work through, uh, you know, hundreds of protesters at our meetings, very uh, hot topics, uh, and watch and watched how decisions are made uh, at the local level and at the state level and how community organizations can really impact the decisions that are made. And then COVID happened and schools were shut down. And as Tiffany and I got to know each other towards the end of 2020, we were having the same experiences. Uh, we were losing votes on our school boards, uh, standing up against forced uh, masking of children. Each of us were separately. Uh, we were fighting to get schools opened. Uh, you know, we spent hours in those school board meetings, sometimes 12 and 14 hours going over the data of what was happening. And I know all of America was very scared at the time. There was a lot of fear, but we had doctors and epidemiologists and we were looking at the data in our state and in our districts and we were seeing that children were not being affected. There literally, when we opened schools, were no children hospitalized, zero from the time COVID started. Um, and this was nine months in. And so we knew children could safely go back to school with some parameters, uh, but the communities were still very scared. And so, you know, it was hard to stand up for what we knew what was right in that environment of fear, but we did it and um, we became friends through that. And so when we came off our terms at the end of 2020, uh, we decided to start an organization to help parents around the country also stand up for uh, the wrongs that they were seeing that were happening either against their children or just in the failing public education system in general. And Moms for Liberty organizes a 501c4 activist organization, as you alluded to, but you also have the sister organization, the 501c3 tax-deductible Moms for Liberty Foundation. Talk to us a bit about the division of labor between those, and I guess more importantly, what are the issues you're talking about amongst those? 
So the 501c4 was our first organization, and it is the grassroots on the ground organization that does, it is the activist organization. Uh, they are legally allowed to do lobbying, and so they've gotten a lot of parental rights legislation, uh, legislation protecting females in sports, uh, legislation making sure curriculum is open to parents. Um, protecting children from gender transition, being gender gender transitioned at school, um, they have gotten a lot of that happened around the, uh, across the line around the country, and that all happens through the C four. The C three was launched, the Moms for Liberty Foundation, shortly after the C four, when we saw that there was a really important role that needed to take place, uh, educating the public. Uh, training our members and individuals, and a lot of those activities take place over in the C th in the C three to help uh, help carry out the work and the mission of the C four. What are some of the issues you're tackling there? It looks like there's a big emphasis on literacy and reading on the foundation side. Is that right? Yeah. So you know, a lot of people don't know, but two thirds of American fourth graders aren't reading on grade level. American education system is really going downhill quickly. Uh, we are working hard to expose that information. Last year's national test scores showed that reading scores in America are the lowest they've been since the 1980s, and math scores are the lowest they've ever been in the country. And so uh, we're in an education crisis. And when you look at Black or Hispanic students uh, some, in many, many cities in many, many states, they are at like a 10 or 15 percent of, of their population can read on grade level. The future of America is not bright if its students are not learning to read, if its citizens are not educated. And so uh, the C3 spends a lot of time shining the light on that, educating Americans on on what's not, not only happening nationally with test scores, but diving down into local communities and showing them uh, where their local school districts are failing so that they can get activated and involved. And you feel like you're moving the needle? How are you measuring success of that? We yeah, we are moving the needle. So uh, last year alone, our chapters across the country endorsed under the C4 uh, in 500 school board races. This is without any dollars being put behind them because the C4 doesn't put dollars behind candidates. Uh, they just they're allowed to select candidates. And um, then on their own time, they can go get involved in the campaigns or um, they can share on social media. So there was no dollars put behind any of those candidates. And our endorsed candidates, many of them just moms that had never run for anything, 275 of them took school board seats across the country. So I think that's that's a sign that uh, we are helping empowering uh, just normal, everyday moms that are concerned about families, uh, that are concerned about their children and their communities stepping up and taking the power back from the teachers unions and others that have been controlling education uh, for decades. Yeah, it's easy to look at that and say, oh, well, you know, a little over 50% success rate. But those are people who probably wouldn't have run in the first place, too, at least some of them. who 76% of them, first-time candidates, had never run for anything. Uh, and then we have stories like in places like Wisconsin, where our vice chair of our Kenosha chapter ran uh, for county executive because they oversaw all the health decisions in the school district. And she won uh, early in the year of, of 2022 uh, and was so popular with the people that she ran for their state house in the fall of 2022 and won. So, you know, we're, we're helping um, get in touch with a whole new uh, subgroup of voters. Many, I think it's almost 30% of our moms had never voted in a primary before. They just weren't involved in politics. Um, and we are, are, we've polled our membership. We have Republicans, Democrats, independents. Uh, we have a wide variety of people, like I said, and some of them had never voted before and definitely hadn't voted in primaries. So we're activating people to get involved and be more civically engaged. I think that's, it's really important for the future of our country. Yeah, I guess that's an important distinction to make is you're not per se an ideological organization. You are really built around these ideas of involvement, particularly parents being involved in getting good education for their kids. I mean, maybe that's an overly simplistic way to look at it, but it's more of an issue set than a than a ideology. I don't think it's an overly simplistic way to look at what we're doing at all. What we're doing is very simple. It shouldn't be controversial. For some reason, it is. I, I say for some reason, I know what it is. We're upsetting the balance of power. We're giving power back to ordinary families, ordinary moms, uh, to, to take back their government and to drive what's happening in their communities and in their school districts to what parents really want. And there's a segment of society that's had control of it for a long time. And so it's making it very you know, full of conflict and, and people to put misinformation out about us and call us a lot of names and things that we just aren't. 
Now, you started the organization in the teeth of a crisis. There was a visceral fight right in front of you that called for action. Now, we're hopefully in most places beyond that. And so you're really building into this more sustaining organization. Talk to me about that transition. How is that going? It's going fantastic. I've known from the day we launched that I wanted this to be a long-term organization. And people were saying to us in the beginning, oh, you're just around because of COVID, you know, it's going to die down. And I knew from the very beginning that that wasn't going to be the case. I've been involved in education for a long time. As you know, I served for four years on the school board. And what I saw when I served is that the communities are not involved in education. Presidential debate after presidential debate, year after year, they would never discuss education. Uh, local, you know, when you look at the turnout for uh, school board elections from community to community, it's so unbelievably low. Nobody's paying attention, yet it's so important and it's failing. When I served on the school board, we would have these uh, school board meetings where people could come in and look at the curriculum, put them out in the paper, do an all call. Nobody would show up. And so when I had the opportunity to help start an organization that would engage people forever in their public education system, uh, I, I jumped on the opportunity, and I'm thankful that, that that some of that stuff happened so we were able to do this. But some of the things we do to make sure it's a sustainable and and has a plan to stay in place is these, these chapters that are under the C4, um, they have to have monthly meetings. They sign a contract that they are gonna, they're going to get together in a group and have monthly meetings and that they are going to review their local school board agendas. Um, their job is to be oversights to the school district, and so they have an and they have active things to be doing all the time on the ground. And I promise you, from four years serving on a school board, there is never a lack of concern of what's happening <laughs> at a school district. This this will go on forever. There's always things that you need to be concerned about. And there always needs to be a watchdog group over school districts around the country. But um, other things that we do under the C3 is our Moms for Libraries program. That's a sustainable program that's forever going to be needed uh, we work with publishers like Tuttle Twins, um, Dr. Ben Carson's uh, organization, uh, all of these uh, book publishers that have wholesome good books for children. Many of them have donated thousands of books to us. Uh, at the very minimum, they give us huge discounts to buy in bulk. And then we distribute them out to our chapters around the country and uh, they get them placed. So they know they're getting placed in public school libraries because they bring them down to the public school librarian to make sure they're on the shelves. Uh, so we're counter, counter, counteracting, counterbalancing some of the just garbage that's coming up in school libraries now with good, wholesome books so that children have a selection of things to choose from. Well, as you say, there will always be parents, there will always be students, and there will always be a need for these issues. And so Moms for Liberty certainly seems to have a long-term place in this. Tina Deskovich, thanks for joining us today. I appreciate the time so much, Peter. Thank you. Grassroots advocates are important year-round. Our friends on the left have long known this. As our guest made clear, however, we can't cede ground to rowdy progressive advocates. When we come out in force, we can cut through the clutter and help other citizens connect to the ideas of liberty. Running TV ads is nice, but people change their minds when they change their hearts. And that takes human-to-human connection. It's exactly what FreedomWorks Foundation, Americans for Prosperity Foundation, and Moms for Liberty Foundation are all good at doing, each in their own way. Maybe you're someone who believes we need the grassroots, but can't commit the time yourself that it it takes to be a good grassroots advocate. Well, don't discount the value of being a donor to the cause. Some have time, some have treasure, and the groups we talk to today, along with so many others out there in this space, have the talent to use both of those gifts wisely. At Donors Trust, we specialize in helping donors use their charitable gifts wisely, offering a tax-advantaged, simple, flexible way to give, and one that is aligned with your free market principles. If you aren't already working with us, now is a great time to explore how a donor advised fund might be able to help you with your charitable efforts. Visit DonorsTrust.org or email me at tellmemore at DonorsTrust.org to start a conversation or simply to follow up about groups you heard about on this podcast. We will be back in a couple weeks with more great groups doing important work for our shared principles. And until then, thank you for being a giver. Let's talk more soon. Mm-hmm.